Our scripture is from John chapter 6, verses 28 through 35. They ask, what must, we, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? Jesus replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him whom God sent. They ask, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as Jennifer has mentioned, Lisa mentioned again about it being Worldwide Communion Sunday. Actually, it's now called World Communion Sunday. Well, I, I thought we'd talk about communion for the service because we, do, we celebrate Holy Communion here every week. And uh, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the sacrament and what it, what it means and how it really developed. But I would like to spend a few minutes on that today. And I got to thinking about when I was a kid, I, uh, many of you know, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, and uh, for the first of about 20 years of my life, I went to the Presbyterian Church, and so I've been uh, United Methodist most of my life. But up until that time, uh, we had communion at the Presbyterian Church in Grandview, Missouri. We'd have it once a month, the first Sunday of the month, as did this church before I got here. And that is the, uh, was a tradition for a lot of churches in the U.S. to have communion once a month. And, and, and I think about Holy Communion and when I was a kid, and it actually kind of made me nervous. I don't know what you ever thought about that, but, but Holy Communion used to kind of like make me a little afraid because the ushers would come by with these trays full of all these tiny little cups. <laughs> And uh, they would hand it to you. And here I'm a little kid thinking, if I drop this tray, I am in, I am in trouble, <laughs> right? And I have to pass this tray to the next person next to me. And uh, then, then we would get these uh, little trays of bread that was really always very slippery, right? The little, the little pieces of, of this uh, wafer. And the interesting thing about that, my mom was the one who always made those wafers for the church. And uh, I used to watch her do those the night before, and, and, and it was really a lot like making pie dough. She rolled it out flat and then cut it in all these little tiny pieces, and to me, they looked like chiclets. So I always thought it was chiclet communion, right? These little bits of tiny bits of bread and a little tiny cup, which at that point, they were still glass. And so you had to gather them all up after service and wash them all for the next communion service a month later. Uh, plus, someone had to go around every pew and find them. That's why we have all these little holes in the fronts of your pews there. That's where you would have put your communion cup if it had come around to, um, to your seat. And so this idea of, of receiving it that way was the way I grew up doing it. And it wasn't until you know, I got uh, older and experienced intinction like we do here in this idea of coming forward to the altar to receive communion that I had any concept of that. And I, I always just thought it was just a kind of a ritual that we did. I didn't fully grasp it and uh, not really had an idea of what it was about. And so I think that's an easy place to get to when you're growing up or even as an adult if you don't think about what the, uh, the sacrament means. What does it mean to do Holy Communion? And so I, I thought about this whole idea of communing together over a shared meal because that's so uh, much of what the Bible teaches about the origins of Holy Communion has to do with sharing this time together. And in the scripture we had for this morning, it talked about when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, that they um, were starving at first, and they're saying, I, you know, God has taken us out of Egypt, out of what uh, was slavery, but also they got to eat three meals a day, right? And now they're out in the wilderness, and they're starving. And they plead to God, you know, we, what are we going to do? You, did you bring us out here to kill us in the desert? And then God brings him what at night? Manna. So God provides a manna, which is kind of like a bread-like substance. We don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about it. But, it, uh, but it's some, somewhat of a bread-type substance that they would receive every night. And the people would eat all that they wanted, and they would be full of that. And the next night they received it again. And the part of the problem they had was sometimes they didn't trust they'd have some the next day, right? They were trying to store it up. 
And whatever they stored up just spoiled by the next day. They couldn't eat it. And they had to trust that God would bring them more bread each and every day. And so when the scripture says, well, what is Jesus going to do for us? Uh, because the, our ancestors ate manna from heaven, that God brought them manna from heaven, the scripture in John says. But, but, but Jesus says to them, it's not Moses who gave them the manna, right? It's not Moses who did that. It was God. That God continues to provide for our, every, uh, our, our sustenance every single day. And that's where it gets hard sometimes to trust that God is going to do that. Sometimes that's what the definition of faith is, it not? That to step forward into the unknown future, not knowing where our next meal is coming from, or our next whatever, our next job, or our next glass of water. I mean, the, the, everything that we have, we have certain assurances that we have them, but we also know that we must have faith in God that all these things will come about. Well, if you go on through the scripture, there's many different times where it talks about shared meals. Like when Jesus was at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, they were running out of wine. And Jesus, what his first recorded miracle is when he tell them, go fill the jugs up with water and bring them to me. And then when they tasted them, they were the finest wine they ever had. And this is part of the same idea that, that God provides not only what we need, but abundantly God provides what we need. And we know of other stories in the Bible where uh, Jesus fed the 5,000 with just a, a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And the message behind that is not, not only the miracle of the feeding, but the fact that Jesus provided more than enough for all the people there. And we start realizing, is this only about feeding people or does this mean something more? Is there something more to this? And I truly think that it points us to God's grace. That God's grace is sufficient for each and every one of us. That God provides us even more than we possibly need. Now, we're not always more than we want, right? Sometimes we want more than we get. But we always get more than we need more than we need. And so, so throughout the scripture we read about different times that God calls people to the feast, this feast of communing with one another, gathering together in the body of Christ and, and the kingdom of God. And through that we have a shared experience. When I think about shared meals, uh, how many times have you gathered together with family or with friends and realized there's a special bond going on, right? This idea of gathering for a family meal uh, or a meal with your friends. And when you gather for that time together, it breaks down barriers. Because this idea of sharing a meal with one another um, allows people to start visiting with each other, allows people this opportunity to relax. Now, if you had a, if you had a, a meal with a lot of tension, you probably get indigestion, right? But if you're at a meal where you're allowing yourselves to visit with people and relax, is a powerful, powerful thing. It has, a, it has an effect on us in ways that we don't, even, we don't even think about. We don't even think about how powerful this experience is because we do it all the time, right? We, most, many of us, or most of us, I probably eat three meals a day and this idea that you, get to, you, you have this opportunity to share a meal with, with someone else is so special and so important. I spent a lot of years in business and one of the best things you could do is to get a client to go to lunch or dinner with you. Right? I mean, any of you that have worked with the public and know that if you can get someone to share a meal with you, you've come a long ways towards develop, developing a positive relationship with them. Because when you sit down for a meal together, you start sharing something that's essential and intimate. It's an essential part of life, but it's also an intimate experience because through that ex shared experience, we, we create bonds with one another. And those bonds are, are hard to break. Right? And nor do you want to break them. But, but this idea of these foster these bonds and helps us continue to be connected with one another. So there's a lot of power in a shared meal, which is what Holy Communion points us towards. A meal with God, a communing with all the saints of, of, of forever. We talk about the great cloud of witnesses. When we come to Holy Communion, we're not only sharing this uh, holy feast with one another, but we're also sharing it in the presence of God and with all the saints that have gone on before. So it's a powerful experience, and that's why uh, many of you, maybe, I don't know, many of you, but some of you may have a question when I got here. I went, I decided we must do Holy Communion every week, which is something I've done in all my churches that I've been a part of. But this idea is that this is, this is, the, the, uh, this is the joining together. This is the communing as one spirit, as the Lord uh, encompasses all of us through his Holy Spirit. This is this joining together. This is why it's so essential that we end each service with Holy Communion, because it's not only 
Is it a reaffirmation of our faith? But it's a chance to say, Lord, thank you for the grace that you've given to us. Thank you for the grace you've extended to me and to each and every one of us and our family and our friends and home. We uh, talked a little bit earlier about the worldwide communion, which is world communion. Now, it was in 1933 that a Presbyterian pastor named Hugh Kerr uh, started this, uh, this special day. It's a special church day. It's not a high holy day or anything like that, but it's a day that we all celebrate this together. And it was in 1933, and if you think back for your history or those of you that remember 1933, it was one of the darkest times in U.S. history. 1933 was the peak of the, of the Great Depression. Over 25% of the people were unemployed. And if we think about that today, when we, we have very low, maybe 5% or less unemployment today, and many of those people maybe are, are not really um, in a position to take a job, but, but they're still unemployed. So we have very low unemployment now, right? So we have this idea that that there are very few people that don't have a job if they really truly want one. But this idea of 25% or more of the people had no work. And it was during this time when the stock market had crashed and businesses were closing daily. The dust bowl was beginning. The, the temperatures had continued to increase and the rainfall had stayed away and the farmers were in crisis. So not only was there not work in the cities, but there wasn't food coming out of the farms. And there was great migration of people to different parts of the country to try and find somewhere that they could grow crops, somewhere where they could survive. And it was in 1933 that Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor in Germany. You can see why this pastor said, we've got to come up with a way to hold ourselves together. We've got to come up with a way to celebrate what's good about this world instead of being focused on all the things that are wrong. And so he started this celebration, this World Communion Sunday, this idea that every church, no matter what frequency they had communion, that, that they would for sure have communion on this Sunday. And over the years, the worldwide name that changed is World Communion Sunday. This idea that, that throughout the world, all Christians are joining together in this sacred moment that helps bind us together as the kingdom of God, that we're part of one body in Christ. It was a powerful statement and it caught on and over time it continued to grow to where it is today. Now, many churches always had weekly communion, right? The Roman Catholics always have communion, the Episcopalians, the the disciples of Christ. But many of your Protestant churches did not. And they would have it maybe once a month or maybe even longer apart than that. And the reason that they did that, and there's actually a logical reason why that happened. But the reason it happened was when the New World, what's now the United States, was, being, uh, was growing and was getting started, that there were very few pastors in the New World, right? There are very few pastors that were actually ordained to that could were authorized to do holy communion in in what the colonies or then in the, the early early statehood and so if there was not a pastor there they would have a lay speaker who would deliver the message and they would have a time of worship but they couldn't have holy communion based on uh, the way they understood that it had to be something that was sacramental it had to be something that was led by someone who had been trained and been taught in this area and this was their or, or ordination if you will they were called to do holy communion so communion then became whenever the uh, the circuit riding pastor happened to get to their church and oftentimes it was like every six months or so before they would get back around to your church before you'd have holy communion again and that's how this got started and then over time, they said, well, we, we don't, six months is not necessary, but we can probably do it once a month now. And so that's where this came from. So you're talking about over 200 years of a history of monthly communion. And it was all for convenience. It was all because there was no pastor there on the in-between Sundays. And so Charles Wesley and John Wesley, those who formed the, the United Methodist Church, um, or what's the Methodist Church, that wasn't United at the time, 
But this idea of the Methodist Church, they promoted the idea of weekly communion, this idea of having communion at every time. In fact, John Wesley has an, um, one of his papers is on uh, constant communion, having communion at all times you gather together. So this is our history. This is our heritage to have weekly communion because what it does is it brings us to that point in the service where we have uh, talked and we've praised God through music, not like the first time I uh, botched this morning. We can ignore that one. But, uh, <laughs> but you praise God through music and through word and through, through prayer. But then when you get to the ultimate peak of the service, you talk about the fact that we can only hold our heads up because God had offered us grace through his son, Jesus Christ. And it is the grace that we, uh, that we together enjoy that empowers us to go out into the world to make a difference, to truly make a difference to everyone that we meet, that they too may know of God's love, may know of God's grace. The act of Holy Communion is not just an historical remembrance, right? We know that it started with, with Jesus in the upper room with his disciples celebrating the Passover, but Jesus was talking about something that was even bigger than the Passover. He was talking about his eternal presence with us through the Holy Spirit. Because when he broke the bread and says, when you eat this bread and drink of this wine, do so in remembrance of me. It's not only about remembering what happened, but it's a present reality of Christ indwelling with us. That his Holy Spirit is within us right now. And it will be eternally into the future. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to come to Holy Communion this morning, I pray that maybe you've picked up a couple of things about Holy Communion that might, might really help you think about that and what the celebration is about what this sacred moment with Christ, uh, what it points us to, and how our hearts are truly warmed by this experience. Amen.